I look to the when I looked to the literature, um, I found that there were some concerning stats in this regard. It, so almost half of clinical teachers are dissatisfied in considering leaving their teaching roles. Um, in addition, teaching can often fall to a few clinicians in a given context who might be at increasing risk of burnout because they're taking on the bulk of the work. Uh, turnover rates between <gasps> clinical faculty can be high and expensive. And there are several claims that medical students and residents are less likely to seek teaching roles. And I think we all can reflect on some of the barriers around this. Um, we often hear claims that clinicians are taking financial sacrifices to teach. Teaching takes a lot of time um, and there may be inadequate teaching facilities to effectively incorporate learners. And so this research is really focused on the clinical teachers as those are most at risk for recruitment and retention issues. There have been a few studies that have looked at the evaluation of teaching incentives. Um, those that have generally asked clinicians to rank order their preferred incentives from top to bottom. Um, and generally what you find is that clinicians are most likely to claim that they teach because they enjoy it, followed by teaching for certain educational opportunities such as faculty development opportunities or library resources or CME credits. Um, some but less teach for recognition from leadership and career advancement opportunities. And last but not least, um, teachers usually are the least likely to teach for money, awards, and gifts. Um, and sometimes they go out of their way to de-emphasize the role that money plays. Um, but there are some interesting nuances to these findings. So for example, while money is rarely reported as a motivator for teaching, it's very frequently reported as a barrier for teaching. So this suggests that money actually is important depending on how you ask. And it also depends on context. So money ranks low amongst those who aren't being paid, but if clinicians are already being paid to teach, it actually ranks quite high. So th this suggests a bit of a more complex picture than we're getting. And perhaps most importantly is the notion that these studies recommend that incentives be developed based on these rankings. But we know from history that implementing incentives based on what people say motivates them can sometimes lead to unintended consequences. I'm just going to mention I can't see the chat while I'm presenting so feel free for someone Gary maybe jump in if there's something that I need to pause and address um, but please jump in and use the chat and I look forward to the discussion at the end. Okay, so just a couple of uh, stories around unintended consequences of incentives. So um, here's a, a young girl. She's really good at playing the piano. Her parents notice that she's playing increasingly difficult songs. Um, and then they start giving her a treat when she practices. And over the next while, they notice that she starts playing simpler songs, the easy ones, uh, just to get the reward because the re she's now playing the piano just to get the reward as opposed to her own interest in, and engaging in the challenge of it. Another example is around blood donations and there have been several studies that have shown that paying people to donate blood actually reduces their willingness to donate blood because paying people sort of undermines the, the altruistic drive to do such a good deed. And so what we intuitively think would work to influence motivation doesn't always work and incentives can, can backfire. And so this is really where we honed in on our paper is to understand how, when, and why incentives are positively influential and how other researchers have attempted to mitigate negative impacts of incentive schemes. So we conducted a critical review, um, which essentially means to look across different fields of study that have sought to examine 
the phenomenon at hand. Um, and it involves an iterative process of reviewing foundational papers within those fields and integrating their findings um, to develop a well-rounded understanding of the question. And we reviewed a lot of different disciplines and ultimately decided to include these three. Uh, I'm gonna go over each of them and highlight their main contributions. And as I do, it'll become apparent as to why we decided to include these three in the final review. So to start off with psychology, um, so a recent review looked at, I guess, the, the big five motivational theories um, and integrated their findings and their um, main messages. And essentially all of them focus on these four attributes. So one's motivation towards a certain task depends on their perceived competence over the task, their perceived ability to do something well, um, values, so the extent that they are invested in completing the task, um, attribution, so the extent to which they can claim responsibility for the outcome, and then sociocognitive elements, so interactions between an individual and their social context. And so an incentives impact would de depend on how it interacts with these four areas. The one motivational theory that has done a lot of research specifically around incentives and motivation is self-determination theory. Um, and this is the theory that places uh, motivations on a bit of a spectrum of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So we'll go over that spectrum briefly and talk about the role incentives play for each. So first you have a motivation. So these are the clinicians who don't teach. Um, and incentives could get people in the door to, to teach, uh, but we really don't know enough about this group of people to know whether they work in the long term. Then you move to extrinsic motivation. So extrinsic, when you're extrinsically motivated, you're engaging in activity to pursue a, some type of separable outcome. So someone who teaches because their department head has asked them to, and someone who teaches because it's, they believe that's what it means to be a clinician and it's part of their, their identity as a doctor. Those two are both extrinsically motivated, but you can see they're very different. Um, the latter has a personal endorsement and value over the task. And when people are extrinsically motivated, this is sort of where you want to get people to be. And incentives do play a role here. Um, incentives in, for extrinsically motivated people should support autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So, for example, you may have a clinician who originally starts teaching because they're told they have to but then maybe they're given a lot of choice over the type of teaching they do. They could do a lecture, they could teach clinically. Um, they're offered a well-rounded program of faculty development to support their teaching confidence. And then through those opportunities, they connect with other teachers who have similar values and who enjoy teaching. And you could promote those more autonomous forms of extrinsic motivation for these people. Then you have intrinsic motivation, which is generally thought of the most revered form of motivation. So doing the, so th th these are the people who teach just because they purely love it. Um, they love the status, the fun of it. They find it an engaging challenge. Um, and a meta-analysis for intrinsically motivated people, such as the girl who played the piano, shows that Almost in all cases, incentives for intrinsically motivated people create unintended consequences and actually lower their motivation for doing it. And this is because the reward is implied as a controller of the behavior. And people like to be autonomous individuals and to do things because that they like because they want to, not because they're given something to do it. So when you look at the field of psychology, um, psychologists would argue that incentive effectiveness depends on what's motivation, motivating the individual in the first place. So they would really encourage you to uh, 
ask those types of questions to get a, a good sense of what's motivating people to teach in the first place. But it does leave us with a few, with a couple of gaps. And while a fully intrinsically motivated faculty would mean incentives are not needed and we wouldn't have a problem, it's likely idealistic to expect that because with most things that are work related, there are some things that are inherently enjoyable, but then there are some aspects of the job that just need to be done. And perhaps more importantly, it ignores factors beyond the individual. So it assumes that if the individual is motivated, it's a done deal. And we know there are plenty of motivated clinical faculty who aren't teaching or who are considering not teaching because of various uh, issues in the environment. And psychology doesn't always address these, but the organizational behavior does. And organizational behaviorists have done a lot of research um, and are primarily concerned with how salary and other incentives influence employee motivation, satisfaction, and productivity. And these theories would typically break motivation up into three components. So factors related to the self, which we've already talked about, um, factors related to the task, whether the goal is achievable or worth the effort, and an area we haven't quite talked about yet, which is the environment. So the environment can create conditions that can either enable or inhibit one's motivation. Hertzberg's motivation hygiene factor is particularly relevant here. So what Hertzberg did was he interviewed employees from very different sectors and asked them two questions. Tell me about a time you felt really good at your job and tell me about a time you felt not good at your job and what contributed to those feelings. And he found that people always talk about the same things in regards to feeling satisfied and the same things regarding feeling dissatisfied. So talking about job satisfaction, things like achieving certain milestones, being recognized for their work, um, opportunities for advancement and growth always come up. And in terms of barriers, things around the environment are always talked about in terms of barriers. So just an example, a family doctor who is keen to take on residents loves teaching and is well recognized and revered for it, but doesn't have the office space to manage multiple learners, spends two or three extra hours a day at the end of the day catching up on work, or long administrative processes to get paid, could stop teaching. And so this fact, this theory tells us that building in motivators and incentives such as faculty development or teaching academies or teaching awards will have is only really half the battle. They'll have little overall influence if the environmental factors aren't also addressed. And so this brings us back to that point where people rarely talk about money as being a motivator to teach, but might often, but is often brought up as a barrier to teaching. And when you're trying to remove or remove barriers or build motivations, um, notions of equity are important. So you may have someone who is perfectly happy with the amount of money they make for a job, but as soon as they find out one of their peers is making more or less, or even the same, um, but are exerting less effort over the task, these perceptions of inequity can all of a sudden make people quite unhappy. And there are three general responses to issues around equity. First, people may advocate for more fairness. Um, and if that doesn't work, they may just exert less effort over the task and just you know, clock in and out, um, or they may abandon the role completely. And I think there are many potential levels of inequity experience with clinical teachers that would be really interesting to explore. Um, one study found that the perceived fair rate of compensation is much higher than what teachers are actually being paid. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we know teaching isn't compensated as much as clinical or research or administrative duties. Um, and I think medical schools vary, but there are also inequities around the way different health professions are paid 
Um, some are paid to teach and some aren't. So there may be a few areas of perceived inequity in, in this case. Um, and it would be interesting to know what, what the fair amount would be for teaching. So organizational behavior really broadens our considerations of incentives to include environmental factors, that motivation doesn't just live within the individual. Um, but they really tend to focus on salary mostly, and so we don't know whether other incentives aside from money are influenced <coughs> by equity issues. Um, and it also suggests that money is more important than what psychologists have argued, leaving us with some contradictory messaging. And luckily, the behavioral economics field has offers us a more nuanced understanding of the impact of money. And it also introduces different forms of motivation beyond the intrinsic and extrinsic spectrum that we haven't looked at. So behavior economists are generally focused on what drives behavior on a societal level. So quitting smoking, for example, um, as well as more promoting more pro-social behaviors such as volunteering, donating blood, or something like teaching uh, medical students or residents. And similar to psych psychology, behavioral ec economics illustrates that people don't always act rationally and seeks to identify why this is. The main theory in, mo the main theory in behavioral economics related to this topic is motivation crowding theory. And this theory illustrates that for certain behaviors, especially pro-social ones, paying people to do things can signal certain messages. It can reinforce, it can tell the person that the behavior is actually difficult or unattractive and maybe they don't wanna do it after all. Um, or it can signal that the individual is not well suited for the task or that they need to be hired for it, um, which can crowd out their altruistic drives for doing it. So now people are no longer teaching to be a good person, but they're teaching to be paid. And an interesting study found that when only when volunteers were paid $50 a month, did they volunteer the same amount of hours as when they were paid nothing at all. So anything, paying them anything below $50 actually reduced their willingness to volunteer and their total volunteer hours. Now, once you hit that $50 threshold and increase that amount, people do volunteer more. Um, but now they're volunteering just to, to get the money as opposed to, to being a good person. So the implication here is that the small to medium size incentives can be the most harmful. And it would be interesting to know where current compensation rates for teachers lies on this spectrum. So in our institution, um, an example, we pay clinical teachers $90 an hour to um, to teach in certain contexts. So where does that <coughs> lay um, compared to $200 an hour or $0 an hour? And it's also important to remember that different amounts of money might mean different things to different people. So $100 an hour might be enough for a resident, um, but is, is not enough for an anesthesiologist. Um, but then setting different rates for different people again, creates uh, risks of inequity. And it's also just not feasible to implement such large incentives, especially in medical education. We kind of have to rely on the goodwill of our clinicians to teach. Um, and even if we were to determine what the threshold value is to increase the number of teachers, it likely wouldn't be feasible to, to pay that much. Uh, one way out of this dilemma is to offer incentives that aren't money. So things like gift cards, even lottery tickets um, or presents have had neutral or positive effects on blood donors, regardless of their size. But it's a very sensitive um, relationship. So even saying that you will offer a $100 honorarium to someone as opposed to offering an honorarium, just by associating the financial uh, amount with that incentive 
will lead the individual to default to those relationships we just talked about uh, when you're paying with money. So this tells us there are some important delivery considerations that also need to be incorporated when you're using things like gift cards. And in these situations, we really need to find different types of motivation to rely on. And this is where the concept of image motivation comes in. So image motivation is one's desire to illustrate to others and to themselves that they are good people who do good things. So something like donating blood, volunteering, or, or teaching learners might not be inherently satisfying, nor are people driven by extrinsic rewards, but they're doing it because it lets them feel good about themselves and their, and their public image. And so in these cases, incentives that target image motivation would be featured around public, public recognition. Um, some studies have shown that larger donations to charities are made when donations are made publicly than privately. So this is why you often see people wearing pins saying that they voted or that they donated blood, um, stickers being handed out. And if these findings apply to some medical teachers, then it tells us that public recognition of efforts might be more meaningful than financial or non-financial incentives. So this would mean that things like graduation ceremonies for completing teaching training, um, teaching awards, or you know, other forms of public recognition within a department might be more powerful than offering uh, money or a gift. So the behavioral economics field has really tells us to be wary of those small to medium sized financial incentives. They can be detrimental to motivation and that for pro-social behaviors, promoting a positive self image or normalizing a behavior within a given environment can be very powerful. But like we said, it's difficult to determine how much is enough and that amount is likely not the same for everyone or in every circumstance. So to synthesize these three fields, uh, we offer three recommendations when considering implementing incentives. So first is to ask what is driving the individual to engage in the first place? So what type of motivation is at play? Do they genuinely enjoy teaching? Are they told they have to teach? Are they wanting to do good and pay it forward to those that taught them? And once you know that, um, this brings us to the second point. So consider the unique interactions between incentives and motivation types. So consider whether an incentive is actually needed. Uh, for people who are intrinsically motivated, efforts may be best spent in reducing environmental behavior, environmental barriers at play. Uh, but for some people, financial incentives or gifts um, might have a role. And then to keep in mind that even if you do manage to find the right incentive for the right person at the right time, it will have little impact in a context where there are a lot of barriers. So it's really important to treat those barriers as equally as important as the motivators and address those as well. Mm -hmm. So implications for these findings, um, motivators and barriers depend on the person in context. They're likely fluid between people depending on the teaching environment and other considerations and they may not be static over time either. Uh, the theories we reviewed offer some guidance on different types of incentives um, and just as if not more important the delivery methods used to um, to offer those whether they're delivered publicly or privately um, and other considerations. And I think most importantly, we need to better understand how incentives operate in health professions and medical education contexts, and if they create unintended consequences in, in, our, in our field and in looking at how to better, better support our clinical teachers. So that's what I had planned to share. Um, 
I'm going to close my screen and take a look at the chat and would love to hear any questions or comments. Um, also, I'd love to give Kevin an opportunity to jump in as well, in case I missed anything glaring. And thank you for listening. No need for me to jump in. Thanks, Catherine. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the discussion. I guess I'm, I'm curious about next steps. So you did a literature review and you, you've got some information about what motivates. What are you gonna do now? Are you gonna do some empirical analysis um, or even check your findings with folks up there? Or just what are you thinking about in terms of next steps? Thanks, Tasha, that's a great question. Um, I've actually just finished my first study that uh, explores these issues. So what I did was I talked to clinicians of various backgrounds and teaching experience and those who love teaching, those who don't teach, those who have quit teaching and asked them these types of questions that we're suggesting that you consider. Um, we asked what, what motivators or barriers are in place and how those change over time, um, what incentives have been offered and how those inhibit or um, build on those motivations um, and and their perceived value over teaching. So it was a really interesting study, literally just wrapped up the um, analysis of that and have submitted it for a publication. So yeah. Yeah, sorry. And I just have one other question. How are you going to account for context and other issues like race, ethnicity, gender, things like that, so sort of larger issues that might also influence some of someone's motivation for doing something. Yeah, I think that's a really great question and very timely as well. Um, and I did see some of these. I think that's why um, I really want to emphasize that it depends on the person and the context and um, people's motivators and barriers vary like even within the individual, depending on their, their family situation. Um, so those with, you know, a, a lot of the younger women with young families feel a lot more pressure uh, to get home to their families after work and are, there's more tension for certain people to teach and to take that much more time out of their clinic. So I think those issues are def have definitely emerged in some of the discussions. So Kate, one of the questions that was posted on the chat um, was from your fellow Canadian, Tanya. She's interested to hear more about the decision to use incentives versus compensation of time. Is this the term used predominantly when work is considered volunteer? Hi, Tanya, good to see you. You're one of, you're one of the three people I know in this meeting. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> um, it's nice to see a familiar face. I think we use the word incentives because we want to look at more than just money. Um, so an incentive can be anything that is implemented to attempt to influence behavior. So we wanted to address things like something as simple as a, a certificate for attending a, a faculty development event. Um, so we wanted we use the word incentives to sort of capture that broad range of things that could be used to influence motivations to teach. Yeah. I, I guess I made the comment interesting and I'd love for you to, to say something, maybe a bit outside the scope of your paper, which I'm very familiar with, as you know, is that around the patient engagement movement where um, compensation is the term um, and uh, it's seen as legitimizing their role. And so if do you have any, um, pearls or anything, or have you looked at what's going on in the patient engagement world in terms of incentivizing or compensating patients for their engagement and inclusion on committees and different things? I see parallels in the conversation. Yeah, I haven't. Um, I think that's really interesting, um, and I'll look into that. I think it's a, it's a little bit different when you're involving a patient in medical education than 
when you're looking at um, clinicians who are teaching. So I think, you know, for someone like a patient who's really taking the, it's, it's almost like a different, the, the nature of the role is a bit different. So I could see why that term is used more in that context. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So Kayla Teal um, said she's curious how institutions might identify which educators fit the various models of motivations and what might happen if you use different incentive models for different types of educators. Yeah, I think um, that's a really great question. And I think one of the things, I think it's really, it's like trying to pin down one's motivation, especially since it is so dynamic and subject to change is like chasing a moving target. Um, so I think it's difficult, but what is probably worth investing in is considering these different incentive model models. Mm -hmm. um, so offering a variety of supports so that clinicians can, and giving clinicians a choice of what interests them so that they can sort of select the incentive or reward that is most meaningful to them at a given time. So sometimes it might be like, I, you know, I just want that hundred, I just want that hundred dollars to compensate for my time. And sometimes it might be, you know, I really don't know if I'm doing a good job of teaching, so maybe I should stop. Um, so something like a faculty development or a, a teaching academy or a bit of a community might be more impactful for those individuals. Okay, so next up is Tony's question. There's been a move in some industries like tech to make compensation much more visible to all employees. And he wonders how such an approach would work in medical education. Um, I suspect not well based on some of what you said, but I wonder if you have any additional thoughts. Tony, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that comment and question you have. Yeah, and it's, it may not be a super informed question. I've just, I've listened to several um, podcasts where they talk about companies moving towards making everyone's compensation compensation available to be found, you know, on, on some website. So you can see what everyone makes and they seem to think that that's somehow improves motivation if everyone knows what everyone else makes. Um, I've seen a little bit of that in the States in that a lot of state schools, you can go on and you can find out what somebody else makes if you're interested, um, but not, not at private schools. And so I just wondered if you had any, I don't know if it was in the data that you looked at, but just sort of do you think an approach like that would, would I be more likely to want to be a teacher if I knew what other teachers made? Maybe not if I saw that it wasn't that much. I think that, yeah, thanks for elaborating on that. I think that bl will blow up or make very available, very apparent any issues of equity or inequity that are at play. So it really has the potential for people to feel unfairly compensated and equity theory like you feel this discomfort if you're under or if you're overpaid so it's not always if you're underpaid that you feel it um, I think that would be a risky approach yeah thanks so our illustrious Pat O'Sullivan from UCSF commented that we have used both incentive and compensation. We do use different models such as Kayla raises. The larger number of faculty are covered by the incentive models. The term citizenship is often used. Is this a term or framing that you found? Uh, thanks, Pat. That's the term citizenship is a bit new to me. Um, would love for you to talk a little bit more about that. Is it used in, in medical education specifically or? That's a, that's a great question. It's used a lot in our context of you do these things. And so when you think about forms of motivation, you do these things, um, there, there's so much chat going on. I will talk about, you know, about this is what you do as a citizen. So it does come up in what you put in, in that extrinsic motivation of, um, I do this because this is what I was hired to do. Um, it has a little more benign feeling at least in my perception is that that is 
more almost internal motivation of this is why I became um, an educator. And so we do need to draw on that. And that is a term that's used. Like we think about, a, uh, I've just been working on, and I saw some of the comments that uh, Deb Simpson made on um, valuing education task force for one of the departments and thinking about what is the right models. And we actually created both a individual's divisional um, and citizen model uh, to think about how to create this um, environment where teaching would be valued. And so that gave resources to divisions to spend on educational activities. It also compensated individuals who had major job responsibilities. And that was sort of how we made that decision. And then we thought about ways of rewarding individuals who wanted to spend more time in education, such as that we go through the promotions process. And then last but not least, we had this wonderful bucket called citizenship, that you are supposed, you do these things because you are a member of the faculty. So, um, and I can see that how that would fit in your, your framing of of the external motivation. Anyhow, this was a, it's just such a globally, it, I thought of as a, uh, a well-used term, but I am kind of uh, fun to read some of the uh, comments on it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, in my, in our recent study, that came out really strong. Like people teach because it's part of their role. Uh, but what was interesting about that is some people frame it as a privilege and some people frame it as a bit of an obligation. So I think there is potential around that word and sort of building the privilege part of it um, to help with those who see it as part of their role, but not necessarily a part that they want to be a part of their role. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. It sort of reminds me of your idea of the image mm -hmm. um, concept. Thanks. And, and Jory posted a really interesting question. Do barriers override motivation and thus should we remove institutional barriers first before worrying about incentives or can incentives override barriers? Yeah, I think, I think it would depend. Um, when I was preparing this PowerPoint, I found a cartoon with um, someone asking an employee, what would motivate you to do your job better? And the employee says, can I just be paid on time? So <laughs> it, it kind of struck me because there is a bottom line for people. Like it, I think it just depends on the barrier and, and what's important to them at that time. So sometimes, yes, I do think the barriers can, can take over. Like if someone feels completely out of their realm with learners um, or completely overwhelmed with having to take time away from their families. Those barriers are going to take, take its toll. But for people who don't have family obligations, um, it may not be the most important thing to address at that time. So I think it, it's worth asking people what you know, what is working for them and what is not working for them and, and using that as a starting point. Um, but good chicken and the egg type question. Yep, and we have time for this one last question. Actually, it's a two-parter from Deb Simpson and Kayla. Um, did the literature distinguish between employed by the organization sponsoring the trainee versus unpaid as external paid by another organization? And Kayla followed up by saying, and do these employed by others, like volunteer faculty, experience incentives from their primary employer for not teaching? Um, thanks for that. Deb and or Kayla, could you, sometimes it's easier for me if, if I hear you ask your question, would you mind just saying a little bit more about that? Sure, I was thinking when Pat was talking, this is Deb. Um, that she's talking within UCSF people. Um, a number of medical schools use volunteer preceptors and who are get a paycheck from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And whether that 
was distinguished in the literature because our the challenge I think seems to be more when you're short and going external. Right. I think this is why like the review we did is interesting, but the context of medical education is quite unique. So, you know, psychologists are really like they're putting people in a room with three toys. <laughs> and if they do one of them, they're said to be intrinsically motivated to do it. Um, organizational behavior or yeah, organizational behaviorists are really looking at people who work in like a hierarchical structure and then behavioral economics do look at volunteers, but like on a broad societal level. So I think it's, it's useful what these theories have to offer, but it's, it's different in medical education where it's true. You do have volunteer faculty, um, but institutions differ. Sometimes it's volunteer faculty. Sometimes it's the role is explicitly one that has someone being paid. And I think even just naming it different things can send different signals to yeah, I, it was really following up, I think, with Kayla's question as well. If you're employed by a different organization and you want to teach as an individual, then you've got a competing sense set of interests. If your organization is supportive in schools or negotiating with the organization, then you might be able to do some of the behavioral economics mm -hmm. and, and address some of the barriers that way. So if it's all in one big lump, I worry about how to distinguish those for action. Because they're kind of just different sets of people. By the way, great work. Thanks, Deb. I agree. It's very, very complex. Excellent. Well, we are out of time. So Kate and Kevin, thank you very much for the presentation is really phenomenal and we're really happy that your work has already been published and so and I saw that it had already been shared on our Twitter feed for the meeting a link to the article so it's out there again for everybody um, but with that being said everybody give a nice round of applause for them um, our next session is supposed to start um, in 15 minutes and we're supposed to have a social time that can be done in small group rooms so i'm going to technically push you out into small group rooms so you can chat if you need to take a quick break you can as well but this way at least you'll have an opportunity to just interact with one another and do some um, informal networking for the next 15 minutes um, and um, then we'll rally back around and Lorelai's on the call or on the Zoom right now. So we'll get started with her um, promptly at half past the hour. <laughs>